Ja, herzlichen Dank. Ich glaube, was ganz klar wurde, wir haben A, sehr, sehr viele Fragestellungen heute mitgenommen, an denen wir morgen weiterarbeiten können. Aber es gibt auch noch genug Diskussionsstoff und Sie werden auch noch Gelegenheit haben, sich hier und heute miteinander ganz analog bei einem Glas Wein im Anschluss zu unterhalten. Abschließend freuen wir uns aber als nächstes sehr, dass Anna Mendelssohn heute bei uns ist. Anna Mendelssohn ist eine Künstlerin aus Österreich und mit ihrer Performance Free Speech wird sie zwar einen Monolog, einen Monolog uns äh, vortragen, allerdings mit vielen Stimmen sprechen. Also Konzentration lohnt sich noch einmal. Wir switchen gleich noch mal ins Englische. Das Assoziative in ihrem Wirken haben Mendelssohn, wenn ich es richtig verstanden habe, gewissermaßen ihre Eltern mitgegeben. Der Vater Psychoanalytiker, die Mutter Schauspielerin. Anna Mendelssohn selbst hat auch erst Psychologie studiert und dann Schauspielerei. Und ganz gleich, welche Themen sie in ihren Stücken verwebt. Die Metaebene ist und bleibt der Dialog, also genau unser Thema heute. Wie reden Menschen miteinander, wie übereinander? Liebe Anna Mendelssohn, bitte. I love men. But you cannot ignore history. And history has shown that it has been the men who have done the raping and the robbing and the killing and the warmongering for the last 2,000 years. It has been the men who have done the beheading and the pillaging and the subjugating of whole races into slavery. It has been the men who have done the money making and the law making and most of the mischief making. And yet, I love men. Do I contradict myself? Very well, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. And I have every right to contradict myself, to switch opinions, to be bigoted and fanatic one moment, moderate and considerate in the next. Because these are my views. And I like speaking them into a microphone. Now, Of course, the fact that I am speaking them into a microphone raises two fundamental questions. The first one is the classic, the lawyer's question, and that is how free should speech be? But I consider the second question equally important, and that is how should free speech be? Matt Gandhi said that we must speak in a way in which we will open our ears, not close them. I personally, I, I like the fact that gangster rappers, they used to have the phrase to come correct. That's exactly what it meant, okay? To come correct was to be mindful of who you're talking to, to be respectful of who you're talking to. That was the initial thrust of political correctness, to be mindful of who you're talking to. And women will often talk about men in extraordinarily hateful ways that we consider as quite normal. But if men talk about women in this very, very hateful way, we often get up in arms. And I guess I would ask, why do we even expect that we can get together? We can talk about things like race and racism, sex and sexism, and perhaps not have some conflict, have some anger. Have you ever been in a love relationship? There's going to be some conflict, right? I guess. I think that part of the danger of free speech in our society today is this deep longing that people have to avoid conflict, to avoid hurting someone's feelings, to not be polite. And so I think the left today is really creating its own decline. The left doesn't know how to be a tribe anymore in the way that the right does. The left is cannibalistic. It eats its own. I know this isn't going to sound very nice, but I think it's very, very easy to fall afoul of the ridiculously high standards set there. I mean, you follow the rules, and if you don't, you're cut down very, very, very fast. And there is oftentimes a kind of arrogance and self-righteousness there. You know, I've had this happen to me. My comments on transgender women, I, I, I said in an interview that I think transgender women are transgender women. And I think there is a difference between transgender women and women who are born female. Well, apparently in liberal orthodoxy, you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> Because in the quest for inclusiveness, the left is willing to discard a certain kind of complex truth. 
I mean, I received tons of emails from friends saying, "Woo, I hope you're all right, you know? Don't worry, we have your back. Why don't you take some time off, you know? Get a massage. I mean, literally, it was as though someone had died. And initially, I didn't take it very seriously because, you know, I like to think of my place in this world as one that is, of course, for inclusiveness, you know? But I think it was simply that I wasn't using the language <laughs> that I was supposed to use, you know? There was this woman who was lecturing me on, on how I had no compassion, you know, how I, I, I was killing trans women and how I needed to shut up. So I think the debate, uh, I, think, I think the response is really not to have a debate. The response is to silence. And I personally, I, f I find that very, very, very troubling. I mean, maybe that's bit just because I'm the kind of person who seems to think that the response to bad speech should always just be, you know, more speech. But um, there was this young woman who clearly didn't agree with me because she said to me, and, and she was white, okay, but she said to me, we have friends in our college and they're black and we want to protect them. And I said, I mean, that's strange because we live in a world that is steeped in racism. I mean, how are you protecting your young friends? Because when they step out into this world, they're stepping out into a world full of racism. Nazis! Fascists! Why do I you? Why do I you? Blavesty! I'm gonna jump across the What What you Cause you're gonna for my fucking 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 for welfare! You fucking the giffin! You fucking fucking Victim! What is the point? What is the point? of using words to explain what I mean. When every word that I use is being received in a meaning which might be the exact opposite of what I intend. I think the argument that I've brought forward with a lot of clarity in these last sentences is of course one for shutting up and being silent. But what is the point of being silent as a means of communication when even the silence itself is misconstrued. To speak or even look in the face of this interminable misunderstanding is impossible. I cannot explain what I mean when every word or look that I use has double or treble meanings and other people take the meaning or significance of my words to be very different from my intended meaning. And that is why I have enough. The right apologizes for nothing. And the left apologizes for everything. I mean, can't we find a balance here? The right? The right have just gone, ah, ah. I'm having that, free speech. And the left? The left is running scared. They're scared to say that they're pro-free speech because they're afraid that they're going to be branded right wing. That's bizarre. It's bizarre, it's bizarre to say that free speech is a controversial topic. That's bizarre to me. We cannot just let them have it. Look, when I say that men are warmongers and rapists, and money makers, one of three things is happening. Either I'm making a joke, yes, yes, it's a sexist joke, but it's a joke, okay? Or I'm saying these words to, I don't know, you know, prove a point. Or I actually do really mean these things, because I'm a sexist twat, but I'm a sexist twat. And I would, I would absolutely defend my right to say these things, that's freedom of speech. And in defending that right, I'm not defending the person who said it. I'm not defending the statement. I'm simply defending the right to say it. Because if you make it illegal to say it, the implication is that it's illegal to think it. And that's thought crime. That's 1984. 
unsavory, disgusting people should be allowed to say unsavory, disgusting things. If you make it illegal to say racist things, that doesn't stop racism. It just hides it. And I don't want my racists hidden. I want them out in the open, okay, where I can see them, where I can hear them. Because I recently read an article about a murderer. His fantasies of murder and violence had started somewhere between the ages of nine and 12. Now, in his early 20s, two months before his wife was going to give birth to his first child, he was walking around the neighborhood wearing a leather jacket with a knife in his pocket. And he saw a woman standing in her kitchen window and he rang the doorbell and when she opened he knocked her down and stabbed her 74 times 25 years later he was still asking himself why he had never gone to see a psychotherapist he had known about his thoughts and his fantasies his answer was that he had felt ashamed. He had wanted to hide his fantasies, bury them somewhere deep, deep, deep down inside of him. Okay, okay, o okay. So some people like to believe that, you know, if bad ideas are let allowed to flourish out in the open, rational debate will come along and they will wither and die. Now, <laughs> the argument that I have against that is all of recorded history. <laughs> I mean, it simply never happens that way, right? If you allow Holocaust denial, for example, to flourish, the result is not going to be that people will see the absurdity and the evil of that idea. The result is going to be that people who never even thought about it will go, alternative facts, alternative facts. Yeah, that sounds right. And then that's repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated and never challenged in your own echo, 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 echo chamber. And we know since Goebbels that constant repetition of a lie is the key to making it deadly and effective. But, I mean, truth needs to be said, right? <laughs> Yeah, you're right, nowadays that's a conservative position. Look, all I want is for people to be, do, say, think, anything. I hurt people for a reason. I like to think of myself as a, as a virtuous troll. Requiring this absolute consistency and forgetting that, you know, people are messy, people are complicated. That's a characteristic of the modern left. And also forgetting some other obvious human truths, like for example, the fact that they want to police humor. It's because they cannot control it, because you cannot control what people find funny. And also nothing amuses people like the truth, right? You laugh because you know it's true. So policing humor for racism and sexism, that's utterly wrong-headed because that's the way we build bridges not how we break them. You make jokes at a bar, you connect people. You know, you make jokes, that's how you connect people. And some of these obvious psychological truths, the progressive left has just simply forgotten. <laughs> I mean, okay, I think we can disagree on a lot of things here, okay? But I think we can agree on one thing, and that is if you don't show up to debate, you lose. Fighting, it's not about winning or losing, attacking or defending, winning, gaining or losing ground.
Instead, arguing is viewed as dancing. So the goal is to perform the argument in an aesthetically and rhythmically pleasing way. I mean, right now we have a discourse that is structured in terms of battle and war, right? But just imagine, just imagine a discourse that is structured in terms of dance. There are agreements made in back rooms that the public very, very rarely hears about. So governments contact companies, pushing them to either prohibit or promote certain opinions. To get out of this, the companies might decide to make these decisions in the future on their own. And then they are the ones making the decisions. So we end up with privately owned, profit-oriented companies deciding what is legitimate opinion, where to draw this red line, what is allowed to be expressed, talked about, showed publicly. What to ignore, what to delete. Some companies like to call this um, content moderation. But I think to outsource these kind of decisions to privately owned, profit-oriented companies is something that should deeply worry people living in a democratic society. So how free should speech be? In Iran, the importance of free speech is just like the importance of oxygen for staying alive. Without free speech, even though we may not be in prison, it feels as though we are in prison. Just like free speech is important, just like oxygen is important for staying alive, free speech is important for human dignity. And therefore it must not ever, ever be restricted under any, any kind of circumstances. Well, yeah, unless, of course, it's used to ignite war. Or violence or hatred against any kind of minority. Or gender. Or vegans. Car drivers, smokers, disabled people. Any kind of sexual or political or personal orientation. So, let me just end this with a question. What do you call a black man driving a plane? A pilot, you racist.